Hello everybody, and welcome to Mystery Disappearance. My name is Dylan Evers, and in this miniseries, we're going to take a look at the disappearance of Joshua Guimon, a young man who disappeared in November 2002, more than 20 years ago. Maybe you're familiar with the story, maybe you've seen the What Happened to Josh episode on Unsolved Mysteries, but regardless, we're going to take another look at this case. In case you don't know the story, I'll give you a little rundown. Joshua Cheney Guimont was born in June 1982. At four years of age, him and his parents moved to a small town called Maple Lake in the state of Minnesota. He is the only child of Brian Guimont and Lisa Cheney. By all accounts, Josh was a nice, bright kid, popular with a good circle of friends, an exemplary son, and always strived for the high marks and accolades in school. He was senior class president and was voted most likely to succeed. He had an interest in politics, and by fall of 2002 was starting his junior year in St. John University in Collegeville, Minnesota, a student and political science major. Josh's friends and family often joked that he would be President of the United States one day, or at the very least a senator. Josh loved mock trials, he loved to debate. He was a serious and studious young man, but he also loved having a good time with friends, whether it's having a few drinks, smoking cigars, partying, or just kick back on the internet. However, on Saturday, November 9, 2002, which seemed like your ordinary college campus weekend, Josh would be seen for the last time when he went to a card party with a couple of friends in the late evening. He seemingly left the party by himself somewhat discreetly and just vanished into the night without a trace. He was 20 years old. To this day, family, friends, law enforcement and investigators are baffled, with the case being cold for a long time. So what happened to Josh? Where is he? It's been more than 20 years, no hard evidence was ever found, and only the vaguest of clues. And that's what makes this case so unique. With so little to go on, it's opened the door for many different theories. From drowning into a lake, to foul play, to being abducted by aliens. Alright, I'm not serious about that last one. But the point is, the theories really go in many different directions. We've barely scratched the surface now, but we will obviously be bringing more details as the episodes go on. There are several resources I've looked into and I will be crediting them as I go. So for the next few Fridays, starting tomorrow, I'll be releasing an episode weekly that takes a look at different theories concerning Josh's disappearance. But before we get into the theories, I think it's important to look at the details of Josh's last day, as well as the days after his disappearance. So in this episode, we will paint a picture of who Joshua Guimon was, his family, his friends, his life, and we will reconstruct the timeline of Josh's last day and the days following, according to sources like findjoshua.com, uncovered.com, and simply vanished. As I mentioned, Josh grew up in Maple Lake, Minnesota. He had a great relationship with his parents, Brian and Lisa, grandparents, aunts and uncles, etc. He also had a good circle of friends. First, there was Katie Benson. They met at an early age in school, and they started dating in their sophomore year. They were boyfriend-girlfriend for about five years, starting from school and into university. However, in the summer of 2002, they broke up. No reason has been specified as to why, but there could be many reasons, like university keeping them busy. Regardless, Josh and Katie stayed good friends and remained close. Josh's best friend was a guy named Nick Hajikovic. Nick was a year ahead of Josh at the university. He was equally smart and driven. By 2002, there were also roommates in St. Mars House on campus, along with four other roommates. It is unknown exactly how long Josh and Nick have been friends, but Josh was in his junior year, so it's assumed they've known each other for at least a year or two. Josh and Nick attended St. John's University, an all-boys Catholic and Benedictine university. Katie attended the nearby all-girls St. Benedict. However, it is possible for girls and guys to have classes in common. So, Saturday, November 9, 2002 seemed like your typical day on campus. 
At 10.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., Josh works on a paper about Alexander Hamilton. During this time, he also uses AOL Instant Messenger to chat with ex-girlfriend Katie Benson. Between 12.30 and 1 p.m., he visits the campus library, probably to check out books concerning the assignment he's working on. 12.57 p.m., Josh badges back into his dorm room and continues work on his paper until approximately 2.30 p.m. Between 2.30 p.m. and 3.30 p.m., Josh checks his emails and does an online search for work near his hometown. 3.46 p.m., Josh checks the college movie station page for movie schedules, then apparently steps out of his dorm. It is unknown where he goes briefly. 3.57 p.m., Josh re-enters his dorm room. 4 p.m., he does some work for the pre-law society. 4.54 p.m., Josh does a Yahoo search on the movie Brewster's Millions. Between 5 and 6 p.m., Josh, best friend Nick, and roommates have dinner. Around 6.40 p.m., Alex joins Josh in his room, and the friends listen to music and search the internet for a couple of things. 8.30 p.m., Josh wants to smoke a celebratory cigar outside with his friends. Nick declines the cigar but hangs around for a bit. Nick then leaves to drive to Katie's dorm. Josh had been invited as well, but he had another plan for that evening. On the episode of Unsolved Mysteries, Nick said he last saw Josh between 6.30 p.m. and 7 p.m., so there is a little time discrepancy there. Between 10 and 11 p.m., Josh is with roommate Alex Jude and another friend named Greg joins them. They drink beer, look up stuff on the internet, and chat. The friends plan to go to a card party at their mutual friend Nate's dorm at Mettencourt, a dorm just outside of campus, after 11 p.m. Josh badges into his dorm room at 11.06 p.m. It is unknown why he re-enters, but perhaps it was to get a few beers, go to the bathroom, or he just forgot something. This would be the very last time Josh's keycard would be used. Josh, Alex, and Greg arrive at Nate's card party probably around 11.15 or 11.30 p.m. The card party has a gathering of about 10 people, and they play Texas Hold'em. Slightly before midnight, maybe around 11.55 p.m., Josh leaves the party somewhat discreetly. One person named Eric recalls that Josh said he had somewhere to be. Some people thought he was going to the bathroom, but the group was seemingly more concentrated on their card game. 11.57 p.m., Josh is last seen by an unknown witness who supposedly knows Josh, walking behind some old dormitory buildings before the bridge that crosses Tump Flake, presumably heading towards his dorm. In the Unsolved Mysteries episode, detectives revealed that a couple saw a man with Josh's description heading towards the bridge at approximately 12.15 to 12.30. This time frame seems to be a little inconsistent. It's possible that this couple got the approximate time wrong. I mean, them passing by a pedestrian on a Saturday night is probably an insignificant event where they probably wouldn't remember the exact time. So either this time is inaccurate, or perhaps Josh was killing time on this bridge for some reason? This is where Josh's trail vanishes. It is unknown if he made it back to his dorm or not, there is no badging data, but many believe the scent ends at that bridge. Later that night, best friend Nick returns to the dorm room from hanging out with Katie at the girls' dorm, badging in at 2.42 a.m. He notices Josh isn't in his room, but the TV is on, the computer is on, and Josh's wallet, car keys, glasses, and contact cases are all present. One roommate was out of town, and the location of two other roommates is unaccounted for. 3 AM. Friend Greg returns to the dorm from the party, but he doesn't live on the same floor as Josh or Nick, so he is most likely unaware. Sunday morning, November 10th, 11 AM. Nick realizes that Josh never returned to his room and doesn't know his whereabouts. 2.30 p.m. Josh misses mock trial practice. This is unusual for Josh. Friends start to worry more. Sometimes during the afternoon, Nick checks AOL, and it shows Josh has been idle for 12 hours. Around 3 p.m., Nick calls Katie to tell her Josh hasn't been seen all day. 4.20 p.m. Dusty, Alex, and Greg go to campus security, St. John University life safety officers, to report Josh is missing. 5 p.m. Nick goes to make the same report. A cursory search is done by life safety officers, but it stops once darkness falls, the situation not yet taken seriously. 9.46 p.m. St. John University Dean of Student calls Josh's parents to tell them nobody has seen Josh since the night before and urge Lisa to report her son missing. On Unsolved Mysteries, Lisa says she received the call around 10.30 p.m. 10.15 p.m. Life safety and Josh's friends search knocking door to door. 11.42 p.m. Stearns County officers received a phone call from Josh's family. After midnight, Stearns County officers arrive on campus. 2 a.m. Monday morning, November 11th. Parents Lisa Cheney and Brian Gimo arrive on campus to join the search. 
The search goes on all night. Josh doesn't show up for class this Monday morning, so by 8 or 9 a.m. the search gets more intensive. Turns County Sheriff's Department, family, friends, and other people in the vicinity start searching. Within a short time, helicopters and divers for the nearby lakes are also brought in. A statewide alert is issued by the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Media's broadcast a missing person report. Tuesday, November 12, horses and riders are brought in. By Wednesday, November 13, hundreds of people had joined the search. The National Guard arrives, as well as a search dog. The dog picked up Josh's scent from Mitten Court to Stumpf Lake to his dorm to the Abbey in the University. Water levels of Stumpf Lake are lowered, dragged, sonar equipment is used, but no trace of Josh is found. Thursday, November 14, a connection is made with the disappearances of other young adults in Minnesota within a short time frame, namely Chris Jenkins, Michael Knoll, and a young woman named Erica Dahlquist. These four disappeared all within a week and a half time frame. The week of December 2, 2002, many of the students attending the card party were interviewed by Stearns County Sheriff Department. December 29, 50 days after disappearance, the family brings in Hoover, a bloodhound used to trace the sense of Chris Jenkins and Josh Gimo. So these events go on and on, and we'll bring up some other details with the appropriate theories. So I hope you'll join me as we take a look at the theories about the mysterious disappearance of Joshua Cheney Gimo, a smart young man with a promising future who just fell off the map one day. Welcome to Mystery Disappearance. In the first episode, we talked a bit about 20-year-old Joshua Gimon, who disappeared in November 2002. If you haven't watched that video, I highly encourage you to do so, as we take a look at the timeline of Josh's last day and the days following his disappearance. Today, we're going to go into the first theory of what happened to Josh. Let's go back to November 2002. Josh doesn't return to his dorm or on campus. Friends start to worry, parents are notified, they arrive, and a considerable search for Josh starts Monday morning, November 11th. While family, friends, and the Stearns County officers question around to retrace Josh's steps, it is evident that his last known location was at a card party at Mitten Court, a dorm house just outside of campus. Around midnight, Josh presumably walks towards his own dorm, which is about a 3-5 to five minute walk. There is a bridge separating the two dorms. Bloodhounds were used to track Josh's scent. They seemingly picked up his scent at Mettencourt, at Stumpf Lake, to Josh's dorm, and then to the Abbey. The scent seems to stop in the middle of the bridge. Now, I'm no expert on bloodhounds or anything, but I always thought bloodhounds were more useful in picking up someone's scent in an area or territory where they normally wouldn't be in. Uh, but Josh's scent was all over this campus, since he's been around for a couple of months into the semester. So, I don't know, Josh crossed that bridge to go to Mitten Court in the first place, so how does a bloodhound lose his scent in the middle of the bridge? I guess they're just that efficient. But Josh did cross that bridge less than an hour earlier, so if the bloodhounds can separate these scents, that's definitely impressive. But, I don't know, I can't put 100% faith into the bloodhounds. But, because one of the scents seemed to stop at the bridge, the first big theory is that Josh might have possibly fallen or jumped off the bridge into the water. Friends and acquaintances report that Josh had been drinking, but wasn't really impaired or wobbling drunk. So, could Josh have accidentally fallen into the water? Now, this bridge isn't above a straight drop into the water. It seems to be built on some sort of mount or terrain. This bridge seems to have a 4 foot wall that you have to climb on, and even then it's not an immediate drop into the water. There's bushes and weeds. On the Simply Vanish podcast, attorney Josh Newville went to take a look with his friend Ted. And they said even if you jump from the wall, you would have to jump 10 feet to clear the brush and even fall into the water. It doesn't seem like a very high drop either. Furthermore, Josh and Tim stated that these waters are only a few feet deep. Josh was around 5'11 to 6 feet tall, so this water probably would not have even gone over his head. He could just stand up. Granted, it was a cold evening in Minnesota on November 9th, and Josh was supposedly only wearing a St. John University hoodie. So, if he didn't drown, could he have died of hypothermia, whether he was in the waters or not? Again, I think this is unlikely. Even if it was a cold night and the waters were cold, it would probably take time for someone to succumb to the elements. It doesn't happen in minutes, except for extreme temperatures. Remember Titanic? Josh could have gotten out in a minute or two if he indeed was in the water for whatever reason. And he was very close to his dorm, maybe a couple of minutes walk away. So, in the end, it is unlikely that Josh fell into the water. 
There was no incentive for him to climb that four-foot wall. It doesn't seem like anybody could fall in the water because of clumsiness or being inebriated. Some people have theorized that maybe Josh wanted to commit suicide and purposely jump in the water. However, his friends and family have never noticed any change in Josh. No change in attitude, no change in behavior, no reason for him to be unhappy or to believe he would even entertain such an idea. By all accounts, Josh was always his same happy, jovial self. And by revisiting Josh's activities in his last day, it's just not consistent with a person being unhappy and thinking about suicide later in the day. Josh's family and friends swear up and down that Josh would never commit suicide. And I do believe they're right, there's just no evidence to support this fact. This bridge and this small arm of Stump Flake don't seem to be, for lack of a better term, a good suicide spot. Even when you look on Google Maps, these bodies of water seem fairly still. It's not like it's a flowing river where it could carry a body over to the larger part of the lake. Josh Newville and his friend Tim pretty much said as much on the Simply Vanish podcast. If Josh was in any of the surrounding lakes, his body would have certainly surfaced, or at the very least certain articles of clothing, like shoes or socks, come off in these scenarios. Although, we never really know what goes on in a person's mind, but Josh's body was never found, so I don't think we're on the right track. There are other theories that suggest Josh might have disappeared, either willingly or forcefully, but we will discuss these in a future episode. The Stearns County Sheriff Department stayed on the theory of the lakes a long time, for many months in fact, much to the dismay of Josh's father, Brian Gimon. Brian never really believed that his son simply fell or jumped in the water. How could his brilliant son, this model student, have such a clumsy accident or wanting to end his life? One thing that probably didn't help in making the Stearns County Sheriff Department pursue other leads other than the lakes is the disappearance of other young college men within the same time frame. Chris Jenkins disappeared on Halloween night 2002, a little over a week before Josh, and Michael Knoll disappeared on November 6, 2002. This connection was first made on November 14th as everyone was still searching for Josh. The police soon stopped their searches though, as winter was setting in and the lakes were starting to freeze. Chris Jenkins' body was found February 27, 2003. Michael Knowles' body was found on March 25, 2003. So, they disappeared within a week from each other and their bodies found in lakes near where they disappeared within a month of each other. These three vanished within a week and a half time frame and within a hundred miles radius from Minneapolis. Once the bodies were found, most people, including the Stearns County Sheriff Department, believed that Josh might have had the same fate, and that his body would be found within a matter of time. I consider the deaths of Chris Jenkins and Michael Knoll very mysterious as well, by the way. Chris Jenkins' death was initially ruled an accidental drowning, but in 2006, a full three years later, that status was changed to homicide. To this day, his murder has not been solved, although his family has their suspicions, but were never able to come up with enough evidence to prosecute. Michael Knoll apparently went out to celebrate his birthday with some friends at a bar. His body was found in a nearby body of water as well, and his death has been ruled a suicide. Although it is entirely possible, but I find it strange that he would bother to enjoy himself at a bar for his birthday with friends, then end it all right after. We don't have a lot of information on Michael Knoll though, so we don't know for sure. That is the police's determination. But these three have a lot of things in common. They were all out with friends, having a few drinks, and walking outside alone at night. They have a similar profile as well. Handsome young men, early 20s, slim built, similar heights, driven, ambitious. Today, investigators don't believe there's any connection between the three. But it's hard to say for sure. The big difference is Josh's body was never found. After the discovery of the bodies of Chris Jenkins and Michael Knoll, it seemed to reinforce the idea that Josh might be in a lake as well. On April 1st, 2003, Brian Guimont met up with the Stearns County Board of Commissioners to put pressure to bring in the Trident Foundation, one of the best experts in navigation or searching bodies of water. Josh's family had to raise the funds, but the team did start their search in the second week of May. St. John's University didn't want these searches during the school semester, so Brian had to wait patiently after classes were done. The Trident Foundation cleared all three bodies of water that surround St. John, that being Stump Lake, Gemini Lake, and Lake Sega Tegan. They issued a statement that Josh is probably somewhere else and recommend the search for Josh to head in another direction. This was part of Brian Gimo's plan. 
Brian never believed his son just drowned. He always believed his son was abducted or victim of foul play. So he was hoping to clear the lakes quickly so as to motivate authorities to pursue other leads. Sadly, Brian still received a lot of runaround, being told by John Sander that Josh's body probably sank in quicksand or was eaten by snapping turtles. But Brian didn't take any chances. He contacted the appropriate professionals to debunk these silly theories. The Minnesota Soil and Water Conversation Districts responded with a letter to Brian stating that there are no quicksand soils that would sink or hide a body in that vicinity. This letter was received on November 18, 2004. You can find this letter on the apmreports.org website. And snapping turtles? <sighs> Gosh, do I even need to explain how ridiculous that is? So, even after the Trident Foundation's letter, which states that there was no body found in the nearby three lakes after a thorough search, there were still some who stubbornly clung on to the theory that Josh had drowned. It took years for some of them to finally let go of it. I wonder why people were stuck on the body in the lake theory for so long. Could it be that Josh's case was compared to Chris Jenkins and Michael Knoll and they expected the same outcome? But there is no evidence of anything, no evidence of an accident, no evidence of foul play, no evidence of a struggle or a suicide. When it comes to the searches on the lake and bringing in hound dogs, St. John University's involvement has been a little flaky. While they seemed helpful at first, a medium to large scale search was launched for Josh early after he disappeared, but as time went on, the university seemed to be a little more difficult to deal with. They eventually called the sheriff department to have bloodhounds removed from campus, not allowing them to investigate inside any buildings. They also refused any more searches on the lake until the school year ended in May. Trying to give the school the benefit of the doubt here, I imagine that these searches were perhaps distracting and a little intrusive for the staff and students on campus. Establishments like this don't normally like to have police or all this commotion around them. But at the same time, one of their students has disappeared, and the fact that they keep hush about it and have been disagreeable or unhelpful at times didn't make them look good in the matter. There will be an entire episode on this campus, believe me. But for now, Josh's scent seems to stop at that bridge. If he didn't fall in the water, then maybe... Welcome back to Mystery Disappearance. In the last episode, we looked into the theories of Josh Gimo possibly falling into the nearby lakes of his campus. Today, more than 20 years later, nobody really believes in those theories anymore. Obviously, if that were the case, his body would have been found long before now. In this episode, we're going to take a closer look at the card party. After all, it is the last known site of Josh, his last social gathering, and his last location that we know is certain. Although we have the accounts of a couple of people spotting Joshua outdoors near the bridge and bloodhounds losing their scent in the middle of the bridge, but we don't actually know for sure if he did cross that bridge again. Some of the theories focus on the party. If you remember, Josh and his best friend Nick were invited by Katie to hang out at the girls' dorm in the evening of Saturday, November 9, 2002. Josh had declined the offer. He had been invited at a card party at his friend Nate Slinkard's dorm a 3-5 to five minute walk from Josh's own dorm. So by 11pm on Saturday night, November 9, Josh was with two of his friends, Alex and Greg. Josh's last batch entry into his dorm was at 11.06pm, but we presume that a few minutes after that Josh and his friends walked towards Nate's dorm. They crossed the bridge of course and arrived sometime between 11.15 and 11.30pm. According to various accounts, the party was a gathering of about 10 people. Now, this number seems to change at different times. I've seen 9, I've seen a dozen, but let's just say for now that 10 is the number of attendees at this party. Josh was friends with Nate and supposedly knew him well. The other students at the party seemed to be either acquaintances of Josh or people who didn't know him well. So this didn't seem to be Josh's usual circle of friends, except for Nate and Alex and Greg who Josh came with. They were playing Texas Hold'em. Seemed like your typical small gathering of university students, playing cards, probably having some beers, etc. On Unsolved Mysteries, ex-girlfriend Katie recalls questioning some of the attendees after the fact, and Josh seemed to be his usual self, joking around, playing cards, etc. Nothing to indicate something was wrong. After Josh's disappearance, there were questions as to what could have happened at that party. Which is normal when you retrace a person's steps like this, obviously you want to hear what the last people who saw him would say. 
So, could something have happened to Josh at this party? Did this gathering of friends and acquaintances cover something up? Well, first off, let's discuss accident. Officers were wondering if some sort of accident might have occurred at the party. What accident could have killed a university student at a gathering like this? Apparently Josh had been drinking beer during this evening, but friends recount Josh having drank approximately 10 beers within a 6 hour period. If it's not your first time drinking beer, this amount isn't excessive. Josh could have been feeling good, but probably not have lost his sharp wit or faculties. One thing that popped into my head was if someone at the party dared Josh to take like shots of vodka or something, then Josh passed out and died somehow, like alcohol poisoning or whatever, then the group, embarrassed that this happened and afraid of legal repercussions, tried to cover it up. That's pure speculation on my behalf though, and no, I don't believe that's what happened. So let's say it wasn't an accident. Would this group of late teens, early 20s students want to cause harm to Josh? And if so, what would be the motive? The students at the party were apparently interviewed two and a half weeks after the disappearance. Investigators recalled that the students' stories varied a bit. Some people didn't notice Josh leaving, others thought he was going to the bathroom. A guy named Eric recalls Josh saying he had somewhere to be. So in short, they more or less claim that Josh just basically got up and left. Assuming Josh went back to his dorm, they supposedly tried to call him, but there was no answer. Mr. David Unzi, a journalist for the St. Clouds newspaper, revealed on the Unsolved Mysteries episode that he did talk to some of the students as well. He mentioned that he got the sense that the students may not have been telling the full truth, as though they were holding something back. He wondered if something embarrassing or unflattering had happened at the party. If that's true, what could the students have been hiding? Why the odd behavior or varying recollections of that night? Now, this is just my opinion, but there could be a few different explanations for this. 1. There are young college students who are being interviewed by police or media for the first time. This is an uncomfortable position for anybody. I imagine that these kids were nervous about the disappearance of somebody they knew, then hundreds of people searching the area for Josh. The scale of it all is a bit intimidating and being interviewed over something like this can be nerve-wracking. Nobody likes to be part of something this grim, even if they had nothing to do with it. So I can buy that these students didn't like this type of attention put on them. 2. They were hiding their own little skeletons in the closet. Technically, there was underage drinking going on at that party. In Minnesota, the legal drinking age is 21, so Josh and some other students were technically not in age to drink alcohol. And of course, college students might be apprehensive about giving this type of information to investigators. If Josh did die somehow at that party, would these students cover it up rather than tell the truth? But there isn't just alcohol, there may have been other things going on at this party. Gambling. One question I have is if there was gambling going on at this party. I haven't seen that mentioned anywhere. They were playing Texas Hold'em, a great game to play with money. In Minnesota, the legal age for gambling is 18, at a casino or racetrack. So technically, a gathering of students like this playing for money would be considered a misdemeanor. Now, honestly, investigators are probably not going to be that concerned about students being one year too young to drink alcohol or a small gathering playing for a little money. They know these are young, ambitious, paying college students, so investigators don't want to slap them with charges unless absolutely necessary. Just like police usually don't care if you're doing a 53 on a road with 50 miles an hour speed limit. Anyway, getting back to the gambling, this is where my attention went to Josh's wallet. One thing I found strange is in an article in the St. Cloud Times, there is a paragraph that says Gimo, who was carrying his wallet, had about 10 beers during the course of 6 hours, Jude said, Jude being his friend Alex. I think Josh's wallet could be a more significant clue than we realize. I find it strange that this was specifically mentioned in the newspaper, but Josh's wallet was found in his room when he disappeared. Now, did Josh carry his wallet on him all evening, but then he decided to go to Nate's dorm and leave his wallet behind? If there was gambling, Josh probably would have brought his wallet. Or did Josh in fact bring his wallet to the party and then he did make it back to his dorm that night? Something else I found strange is Josh's short time at the party. It sounds like he was there for just half an hour or so. Some people have told me that that's normal for college students. They kind of go from one place to another. Josh turned down hanging out with Nick and Katie at the girls' dorm for this short stint at the party. Maybe Josh just gambled a couple of hands, lost his money and didn't want to bet anymore. Or 
Did he leave his wallet at home and was leaving the party to go get it and then something happened to him? It is highly likely that Josh had other plans after the party, but that will be its own episode. I do think the wallet is a clue that will return in play later. This information probably wouldn't help find Josh, but we need every little piece we can get. Continuing on with the students' bad habits, there is of course recreational drugs. It's not unusual for students to experiment with different things, alcohol, drugs, etc. I'm sure that every college or university campus have their own little rings going on. But you wonder if those little rings are connected to some bigger rings, some bigger underground operations that are well protected by certain individuals. Could Josh have somehow messed with such a ring, which led to his disappearance? Of course, that's just speculation, and there is no evidence of this, but again, we're throwing theories surrounding the party. I did come across something that I hadn't seen or heard anywhere else. On the apmreports.org site, there are documents on certain letters sent by or to Brian Gimon. One is called Correspondence between Brian Gimon and Minnesota Attorney General Mike Hatch, 2005. This letter was issued by Brian and his attorney, Jim Rothstein, on February 17, 2005. At number 2, paragraph E, it states that Katie, along with Greg Warden, Alex Jude, and Nate Slinkard, came to confront Brian in a restaurant. One sentence states, when questioned about the narcotics business they had going on, they had nothing to say. It is apparent that they knew what I was talking about. The Attorney General responded with a letter on March 7, 2005, and here is how they responded to that statement. I quote, You indicate that you confronted the students about using drugs and they had nothing to say about it. In all candor, it would be surprising if students did not react the way you describe. Street drugs and recreational drugs are known to be utilized on college campuses, and it would be surprising if any college students were willing to acknowledge that they had used drugs. I presume that you are inferring that these students somehow caused your son's death because they needed to cover up a phony identification card or that they had acquired drugs. Given the proliferation of phony identity cards on college campuses, it is difficult to speculate that any group of college students would want to retaliate against a student because of such circumstances. I haven't noticed this narcotics things mentioned anywhere else. It's possible that it has nothing to do with Josh. Maybe it was a planned scare tactic by Brian's lawyer to subdue the students into talking. Which brings us to our next subject, fake ideas. Fake ideas were found on Josh's computer. There was speculation as to whether Josh had some form of small fake ID operation on campus. Could Josh have gotten in way over his head with an operation that was taken seriously by some? Could Josh have gotten killed for this? But this fake ID ring was kind of debunked in the Simply Vanish podcast. Josh Newville was talking with Justin Thole, and they mentioned that only four or five fake IDs were found, none of which were Josh's. Mr. Newville also mentioned that the fakes were laughably bad, and probably could not have been seriously used. Maybe just to buy alcohol or to get into some bars? So did Joshua really have some fake ID ring going on, or was he just fooling around with some program? See what the procedure of making a fake ID, or even a real one is. It wasn't unusual to play around with programs like that at the time. So if you're wondering why I'm bringing up all these vices, it's mostly to brainstorm any possible scenarios involving Josh. Did Josh ruffle the wrong feathers? Was a coup planned against him at that card party? Well, I think there are too many pieces missing to that puzzle. Even though Lieutenant Vic Weiss and David Unzi mentioned on Unsolved Mysteries that the students' responses were slightly odd, or that they felt they hadn't told everything they know, Lieutenant Vic Weiss also mentions that if some sort of foul play did happen at the party, it would be difficult for 10 young college students to keep a tight lip on it. Three of these students were good friends of Josh's, and he didn't have any enemies as far as we know. Josh's mom, Lisa Cheney, also mentions that the kids at the party might know more than they say. So why aren't they talking? Could it be because they were hiding some bad habits and protecting their own interests rather than revealing the full truth? Are they keeping something bottled up even after 20 plus years? But of course, it is possible that they did tell everything they know, and that Josh just walked out of the party on his own volition, discreetly. And if he did that, why? Welcome back to Mystery Disappearance. In the last episode, we took a look at the card party, Josh's last known social outing. A party with a total of about 10 students, there were questions as to whether this small group could have been responsible for Josh's disappearance somehow. 
As we continue taking a look at the people closest to Josh, today we focus our attention on ex-girlfriend Katie Benson and best friend, roommate and mock trial co-captain Nick Hydrakovich. Other than Josh's family, these two seem to be the closest to Josh. They would never hurt Josh, right? Well, let's take a closer look. As I mentioned in the first episode, Josh had met Katie when they were still kids. They started dating their sophomore year in high school, so they were around 15 years old. They were high school sweethearts, Josh was senior class president and was voted most likely to succeed. And of course, Josh and Katie went to prom together. After they graduated in 2000, they both went to attend two sister campuses in Collegeville, Minnesota. Josh went to the All Boys St. John's University and Katie went to the nearby All Girls St. Benedict. I stated before that I didn't know exactly when Josh met Nick Hajjikovic, but I believe they met in this first year. While Josh was in his freshman year, Nick was a sophomore, one year ahead of Josh. Both students in political science, they both became close friends, having common interests, a competitive intelligence, and a strong drive to succeed. I don't know what Katie's major was in, but she did participate in Josh and Nick's mock trials in some capacity, whether as a timekeeper, a mock witness, or whatever. So, by all accounts, these three were very good friends. Josh had a girlfriend, his best friend, a bright future ahead of him, he seemingly had it all. On the Simply Vanish podcast, a lady by the name of Olga Zentino was interviewed, and she provided very good insight into the trio. It seems as though the mock trial was heavily set in motion by Josh and Nick, but Nick was mostly the driving force into getting it going. Miss Olga was their mock trial coach, and according to her LinkedIn profile, she was a judicial law clerk during this time. Before the summer of 2002, she recalled arguments between Josh and Katie. Sometimes Miss Olga shared a car ride with them, or interacted with them around mock trial, or in hotels when they traveled to other cities. Josh and Katie had been together for more than four years at this point, and according to Olga, they had some arguments. During the summer of 2002, Josh and Katie broke up. I wasn't sure who initiated the breakup, but I found a newspaper article where Katie states, the breakup was a mutual decision and we talked regularly. We needed to focus on ourselves. Olga said they were mature, remained friends, and had fewer arguments now that they were officially broken up. Nick stated that a weight seemed to have been lifted off Josh's shoulders. They still hung out a lot and chatted on AOL as well as emailed each other. As far as Olga observed, Joshua and Nick were always good friends, never had any arguments with each other, they worked together well on mock trials, etc, etc. Olga had seen all three of them the weekend before Josh's disappearance, the weekend of November 2nd. Sadly, this mock trial weekend was the last time that Brian Guimont saw his son as well. On the episode of Unsolved Mysteries, it was revealed that Josh and Nick had an argument in the evening of Friday, November 8th, the day before the disappearance. Apparently one of Josh's roommates had told this to Stearns County officers. Some of Josh's roommates were only interviewed by 2010, by the way. Supposedly the argument concerned ex-girlfriend Katie. So what was going on here? This revelation on Unsolved Mysteries seemed to have surprised a lot of people. It surprised Josh's family, it surprised Miss Olga Zentino, it surprised Simply Vanished podcast host Josh Newville, who had done several episodes on Josh before the airing of Unsolved Mysteries. As we dive in, it becomes apparent that Nick and Katie might have started having some chemistry together. On Unsolved Mysteries, both Katie and Nick admitted to having a certain level of attraction for each other. Now, a lot of people will jump on Nick over this, like, Oh dude, how could you? That was your best friend's girlfriend. Bros before, um, girls. Blah blah blah. Now, remember, a lot of these kids come from small towns, and this is a small campus where people have small circles of friends. It's not that unusual for an ex-girlfriend to end up with one's best friend or whatever. Does it create awkward situations? Yes, possibly. People on social media today would jump all over something like this but it's a lot more common than we think. I mean, Josh and Katie did officially break up in the summer, so it's not like Nick was moving in on an active relationship. Did Nick and Katie start having chemistry a little soon after the breakup? Eh, maybe a little bit, but Nick hasn't committed any crime here. He stated that him and Katie kissed one or two times. It seems as though their chemistry was evident, and friends wondered if something was going on between the two. Even if they were trying to keep it discreet and on the down low, chemistry between two people is always kind of obvious. I suspect Josh either knew what was going on, or at the very least suspected. We don't know how Josh felt about this. Could this be the reason for their argument on Friday, November 8th? 
Now, do I find the argument suspicious between Josh and Nick? Well, honestly, no, not particularly. I mean, Josh and Nick were both smart, strong-willed individuals who loved to debate. They worked together a lot. I mean, they lived in the same dorm, they worked together on mock trials, they hung out, etc. Sooner or later, good friends are going to argue. So, we don't know for sure if this argument occurred or not, but I can't buy that it was just a regular friend scuffle. Obviously, if Nick and Katie were getting closer, it could potentially cause tension within the trio of friends. But at the same time, you can't always stop chemistry. It happens when it happens. So I'm just speculating, but you gotta wonder if this was one of the reasons Josh didn't want to hang out with Nick at Katie's dorm and decided to go to the card party instead. But we don't know for sure, maybe Josh had other things on his mind. Fast forwarding to Josh's disappearance, there were things to consider when it came to Nick and Katie. When interviewed, their stories differed a little bit. Nick stated to officers that he was at Katie's dorm and left sometime after 2 a.m. Nick had his own car, and the drive from the girls' dorm to the boys' dorm was about 10 minutes. Records showed Nick's keycard was used at 2.42 a.m. to re-enter his dorm. So, if you just look at Nick's story, everything checks out. However, when Katie was interviewed, she stated that Nick left the girls' dorm at 1 or 1.30 a.m. So, that would mean that there's a chunk of time missing. If this were true, then what was Nick up to for 1 plus hours? Did he go grab a burger? Did he get a quick hookup? It is possible that the time Katie gave is inaccurate. I mean, it's Saturday night, they're having a fun time, having a few drinks, and you lose track of time. So, she might not have noticed exactly what time it was when Nick left. As far as I know, Katie has never corrected this time. She never stated that she wasn't sure or anything. Nick was also asked if he was willing to take a polygraph test. While he initially said he would think about it, when it came time, he declined. This is where Nick started to arouse suspicion, although he was never officially confirmed as a suspect. So, what's going on here? Could Nick be somehow involved in Josh's disappearance? Does he fall into the, the best friend did it cliche? A new blossoming romance getting rid of a former lover? With the possible unaccounted time and refusal to take a polygraph, Nick and possibly Katie became a possible theory in Josh's disappearance. Now, if you look at the times for that night, it is theoretically possible. If Nick had planned well in advance, maybe he could have pulled this disappearance off. But would he want to? What would be his motive? I suppose if you like Katie, love is always a motive, crazier things have happened in this world. However, I am skeptical. Now, I'll admit, when it comes to Nick, I kinda went through the motions like everyone else. Like, what's up with this guy? He looks kinda suspicious, there's unaccounted time, he refused to take a polygraph, etc, etc. But the more I thought about it, the more the theory seemed to fall apart for me. I mean, even with the one hour plus of unaccounted time, What's the scenario here? Did Nick murder Josh and forever hid the body and all the evidence while living in the same dorm room with him? I think even an experienced serial killer would have trouble pulling that off. I mean, Josh left the party at around 11.55pm. Let's say that the earliest Nick could have been back would be 1.10am if we take the earliest time possible that Nick left the girl's dorm. So where was Josh within that time? Possibly his dorm. Did he somehow meet Nick outside? There is no badging data from either around this time. They didn't have cell phones either, so no texting to set up a meeting time in place. Let's say they meet up outside and drive somewhere. Nick comes back and badges back in at 2.42 a.m. But you see what I mean, if you retrace the steps, the theory doesn't hold up too well. It doesn't really give anybody enough time to orchestrate the perfect clean disappearance. Also, if you look at Nick and Katie's behavior on the day following their disappearance, it's pretty consistent with worried friends. At 11 a.m., Nick realizes that Josh never returned to his dorm. By afternoon, Josh misses an appointment, so Nick and friends grow more worried. By dinner time, reports are made to life and safety. By evening, the circle of friends panic, etc., etc. Nick and Katie have spent a lot of time helping the searches for Josh, as well as making ribbons and other engagements into helping the searches as best they can. As for the polygraph test, although a lot of people find it suspicious that Nick cancelled it, but it's not like he refused right off the bat. He said he'd consider it at first, and then we learned from Olga's interview in the Simply Vanish podcast that Nick in fact had contacted her to ask if it was a good idea for him to take the polygraph. Olga said she didn't have the expertise at that time to give that advice, so she did direct Nick to someone who did. A friend of hers, who was into family law and a public defender, she responded with, why help the police do their job? So obviously she advised Nick against it, and I'm sure Nick asked the opinions of other professionals as well. 
So what Nick stated on Unsolved Mysteries was true. Polygraphs are not 100% accurate, and if you happen to set off one question that comes up false, you could risk the officers dropping other investigations like searching the lakes or pursuing other leads, and wasting valuable time and resources investigating you. Maybe it would have been best for Nick to take it, but refusing it doesn't make him guilty. When asked the question, Katie doesn't even flinch when it comes to the subject of Nick being somehow involved in Josh's disappearance. She knows he didn't do it. I don't think Nick had any big enough motives to cause harm to Josh. I feel as though he would have had way too much to lose and too little to gain. Even if Nick and Katie had some feelings for each other, those seem to have gotten squashed once Josh disappeared. There's no mention of them riding off into the sunset together, although they remained friends. But Josh's disappearance put a bad tone on everything. What about Katie? Would she have a motive? Was she heartbroken over Josh enough to plan a coup like this? Pfft, I don't buy it. By all accounts, Josh, Nick and Katie all seem to be well-balanced individuals, smart, calculating, level-headed college students. Today, more than 20 plus years later, Nick and Katie seem to be working in their respective fields and there are no records of them in any criminal behavior nor any misdemeanors of any kinds. I'm sure Nick and Katie must have felt some level of guilt over the tragedy that occurred. In the first few days, they didn't know if Josh had disappeared or drowned. When something like this happens, you kind of reflect on your own behavior and inevitably blame yourself. Like, is this our fault? Did we cause this somehow? Did we cause our friend to do something drastic? My heart goes out to Josh's family, but my heart also goes out to Katie and Nick. After all, this was their good loyal friend. I'm sure they must have suffered a lot through this. I don't know if they still feel guilty today, they certainly know that whatever happened wasn't their fault. Although I can't rule Nick completely out as a possibility, but it would seem like something much more sinister happened to Josh. Welcome back to Mystery Disappearance. So far we've looked into the theories of the surrounding lakes, friends at a card party, and ex-girlfriend Katie and best friend Nick. Today we focus on theories concerning the university itself, St. John's University, an institution of learning and building your future, for a price. A university campus would never be guilty of harm coming to one of their students, right? Well, there's a lot to unpack here, so let's take a look. First, a little history of the place. St. John's University is an all-boys Roman Catholic liberal arts school in Minnesota. It is located in Collegeville. It is a 10-minute drive from the all-girls St. Benedict University, located in St. Joseph, so they are technically located in two different towns. St. John's University was founded in 1857, so it has a long history. Monks have occupied this place since the very beginning. They serve as spreaders of the word of God, they serve as life coaches, and of course they serve as teachers and professors. So obviously this long time institution holds a lot of power and influence in this region. Yet there are a lot of theories about Josh's disappearance that tie into this campus. You might be thinking, how could a campus be responsible for the disappearance of one of its pupils? Well, one of the earlier theories was that Josh might have been struck by a car, by one of the driving monks. Since Josh was walking alone after he left the party, he probably had to cross a road or two and possibly walk through a parking lot. And it could have been an unfortunate accident. I believe this theory was first brought forth by a gentleman by the name of Patrick Marker. Mr. Marker stated that monks on the university had had a history with alcohol. He theorized that a monk or monks might have accidentally hit Josh with their car while intoxicated. Then the university made the decision to cover it up, afraid of a scandal. Sounds far-fetched? Well, not when you dig deeper. You see, Mr. Patrick Marker has had history with St. John's. He attended in the early 1980s, and he was victim of a sexual assault by a monk. It took some time, but Mr. Marker eventually investigated his monk through other victims. And he uncovered an iceberg of corruption, conspiracy, sexual misconduct, and hush-hush. Today, Mr. Marker is aware of over 104 credibly accused monks, some dating back as far as the 1970s and 1960s, some who are deceased now. He's aware of hundreds of victims and recounts over 250 names and stories he's heard in over three decades. His goal has been to be an advocate for these victims and to expose the names of perpetrators on his website, today known as BehindThePineCurtain.com. So how does this tie to Josh? Well, get this. 
Patrick Marker started his website in June of 2002. Back then it was called the Abuse Disclosure Project. On October 2nd, 2002, a little over a month before Josh's disappearance, something major occurred. Settlements for cases of sexual abuse on campus came to light. The name and files of several monks were released to the public. This was on the news, this was in newspapers, etc. With the increasing accusations of sexual misconduct over the years, I assume St. John's was forced to address it in some fashion. The campus was essentially taking a hit and tried as best they could to save face and turn it around into a positive message. In that same month of October, Mr. Marker joined the external review board. Upon hearing this news, the community was definitely shocked and lots of discussions were being had. This was the talk of the town and campus. One of these outraged people was none other than Joshua Guimond. Over the next few weeks, Josh had voiced his opinions on this matter and was irate that the university would protect these sex offending monks, sending them to camps after a misconduct only to return one or two semesters later. Family and friends recall how Josh wanted to write a paper on the subject. Now, there's never been any evidence that Josh was working on such a paper, although internet searches were made on his computer. On October 3rd, 2002, at 8.52am, Josh made a search for St. John's Abbey Statute of Limitations Conspiracy, so it's evident that Josh started searching pretty early after the revelation. On October 22, 2002, Josh viewed the Star Tribune story entitled, St. John Launches Ad Campaign to Counter Image Woes. Interestingly, we learned on the Simply Vanish podcast from Miss Olga Zentino that Josh had talked to her as well about the sex abuse scandal and that he in fact did visit Mr. Patrick Marker's website. I thought that was an interesting bit of information because this website reveals the names of perpetrators, even some still active on campus or at other employments according to victim statements. Although back then, this website was very new so I don't know how much information was on it at that point, but it makes you wonder what information Josh came across. Did the website reveal the names of credibly accused monks still on campus? Did Josh come across information that he shouldn't have? Did Icarus fly too close to the sun? Josh voiced his outrage to friends and family, but to what extent did he voice his outrage to his professors and monks on campus? Now, I want to believe that these monks would have been on their best behavior in the aftermath of this scandal. I want to believe that. But was that the case? The sex abuse scandal was revealed in early October and Josh disappeared on November 9th. But doesn't that seem a little quick? Let's say some monks were responsible for Josh's disappearance. How did things escalate so quickly to the point they felt that their only option was to make Josh vanish? Did Josh significantly ruffle some feathers in such a short time? I always felt that Josh would have had some major altercation with a monk for things to progress this far. However, family and friends don't state that Josh ever had any confrontations or provided any names. So we don't know exactly what Josh knew. The sex abuse scandal was a talk of the town and campus for several weeks. I mean, there were several victims that the Abbey settled with. Mr. Patrick Marker had been a thorn in the university's side and worked to bring perpetrators' names to light, even creating a website for this purpose. So why pick on Joshua? Were there monks who seriously felt threatened by this young junior running his mouth a little bit? It is possible. Coming back to the accident theory, if some monks were driving under the influence and hit Josh, it is possible that they got rid of all the evidence because the campus wouldn't have been able to handle another scandal a month after the first one. Now, there were plenty of suspicious or credibly accused monks still on campus around the time Josh disappeared. One of the more suspicious monks was Father Bruce Wolmering. Almost a year after Josh's disappearance, a profile of Josh's likely abductor was released by Dr. Aubrey Immelman, a professor at St. John's University who had previously done psychological profilings. He claimed that this profile was created as per an FBI crime classification manual that draws and outlines the type of sex offender that would abduct a student without leaving any evidence. He would be very familiar with the college campus from which the victim disappeared would know whether the campus had surveillance cameras and where they are located. The offender may previously have come to the attention of authorities as a result of allegations of inappropriate relationships with younger men. The offender likely would have rehearsed his abduction plan. 
He used a con or ruse for assistance of directions, feigning a fall, accident, or injury to lure a student late at night into a vehicle, to an isolated area concealed from public view, or to an indoor location over which he had great deal of power, example basement, garage, or office area. He would have an extensive collection of bondage pornography, though this would likely be a close guarded secret may have changed jobs or left the area until the dust settled enough for him to feel it was safe to return. Apparently, shortly after Josh's disappearance, there was a note on Bruce Wolmering's door stating that he was off for a few days and going to his cabin somewhere. St. John's University recognized this profile as a strong match for Bruce Wolmering, and they did not want this profile to get out to the public. Even Stearns County Sheriff Department tried to stop Dr. Aubrey Immelman from publishing this information. They felt that it could tip off the perpetrator who would then cover his tracks or hire a lawyer. The profile of Josh's likely abductor was first drafted in 2003, but wasn't made public officially until 2006. Abbott John Clausen, who's been Abbott at St. John's University since 2000 and continues to still be Abbott at the university to this day, greatly feared a connection would be made between Bruce Wolmering and Joshua Guimond's disappearance. Father Wolmering has quite a long rap sheet, with several victims dating back to the 1960s. And get this, he engaged in sexual misconduct in late 2002 and early 2003, the very school year that Josh disappeared. I guess the monk abuse scandal didn't scare him. After several complaints from the now anxiety-ridden student, Father Bruce Wolmering was forced to resign from his position, in spring once the school year ended. Good God what's going on here. St. John's knew about his history, but they kept protecting him and employing him, and worked hard for his name not to be revealed to the public. Now, there's no evidence that Father Wolmering ever murdered a student or even abducted one. These sex offending monks are groomers who use time to create trust, and may eventually provide alcohol and drugs to lower their victims' inhibitions to then commit their sexual offenses. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're killers or expert body hiders or evidence hiders, but at the same time, how far would one go to preserve the integrity of their vocation and not tarnish the reputation of the Abbey and University? Was Josh's one and only murder? Father Bruce Wolmering died in 2009 and under very mysterious circumstances. The official police report states that he went into cardiac arrest and fell to the ground and got up several times. He cracked his skull and a rib punctured his lungs, which led to a lot of blood loss. Sounds like a pretty violent self-inflicted trauma. Although nobody else was found at the scene, but some people wondered if one of Bruce's former victims could have come back to retaliate. Even more suspicious, when Father Wilmering died, police taped off his bedroom like a crime scene. They took his computer. I suspect they knew he had either some form of pornography or maybe had produced some himself. Some people wonder if, if there would be information about Joshua Guimon on that computer. Stearns County has never revealed what they found. It makes you wonder to what extent Stearns County protects this campus. If there was evidence on Josh on that computer, would the detectives reveal it and potentially open a can of worms of lawsuits against the university? Or would they find it more beneficial to keep hush about it and not bite the hand that feeds the nearby communities? Let's not forget, law enforcement has a tendency of protecting an institution more than any individual. Institutions would rather protect themselves and their image, even at the cost of one or more individuals. It definitely makes you think. As for Abbot John Clausen, I wish I could enter his mind and see what he knows about all of this. I suspect two possibilities. One, he knows exactly what happened to Josh and has worked hard to stay silent and get the attention of media and law enforcement away from the campus. Or two, it is possible he has no idea what happened to Josh, but still, he tries to make sure the trail of the investigation doesn't lead back to the campus or to any of his monks. Mr. Patrick Marker eventually resigned from his position as member of the External Review Board. He had a conflict of interest. The campus didn't want to make Bruce Wolmering's name or crimes public, much to the disapproval of Mr. Marker, who considered Wolmering to be one of the more dangerous monks. The campus seems to pick and choose the names of offenders they release to the public, in a very calculated way that minimizes damage to their image. There's a lot of damage control going on here. It is also worth mentioning that at least two credibly accused monks lived in the dorms alongside the students. Josh's dorm was St. Mars House and a monk by the name of Jerome Tupa lived in or around there. 
General Tupo was into artwork, but some thought that this interest crossed the line into pornography, most likely underage. He's had some questionable conducts as well with at least two students. At Mettencourt, where the card party was, a monk by the name of Tom Andert lived there. Father Andert had at least two victims who were both 14 years old at the time of their abuse. One of the boys committed suicide years later. Patrick Marker doesn't believe these monks were ever questioned by police or even looked at after Josh's disappearance. I wonder how they could have planned to abduct Josh though. Josh went with some friends to Mettencourt, but he suddenly left by himself. Nobody knew Josh would be walking outside alone at a specific time. Even if one of the monks was tailing Josh, it didn't give them a lot of time to intercept him, unless it was by pure coincidence as they passed by. So it makes you wonder if something had been pre-planned with Josh somehow. But anyway. And there were other monks with histories who were active on campus during the year of Josh's disappearance. Father Robert Koopman apparently had a relationship with a student Josh knew well, and Father Finian McDonnell admitted to having more than 200 sexual encounters, some of them being children overseas. Some of these monks held positions in psychology departments or some other counseling capacities. Though there is no evidence that Josh ever sought counseling or ever was a victim of abuse, though the possibility is there, Josh was possibly questioning his sexuality. And we'll touch on that more in the next episode. But even 20 plus years later, St. John's University has done very little to advance the investigation on its missing student. With years and decades of sexual abuse coming to light, they might have found it more advantageous to phase out any mention of Joshua Gimon. As far as we know, no other students have ever disappeared from this campus or got killed on campus. There are a lot of monks with sexual histories, but no evidence of murders or attempted murders. This campus, though, seems to be good at hiding things and sweeping facts under the rug. But as far as we know, nothing like this has happened before or since. So, once you start peeling the layers of this campus, you find a long history of deceit, lies, manipulations and sexual abuse. It's unnerving, it's disturbing, it's unsettling, but at the end of the day, there is no evidence to connect any of the monks to Josh, as suspicious as they look. Stearns County seems to be very happy to investigate any leads that are not connected to the university. They don't seem to want to tackle that dragon. Even the episode of Unsolved Mysteries barely touched on the monks' abuse scandal. They spent more time on an orange Pontiac Sunfire. So, were some monks responsible for Josh's disappearance? Could it have been a mere car accident and the university decided to erase all trace of it for fear of a second scandal that would probably have spelled the end for this campus? Or did some monks overreact and decided to make Josh disappear over a paper that he most likely didn't start writing yet? On the Unsolved Mysteries episode, Josh's mom Lisa stated that Josh was smarter than he should have been. That worries me a bit because it makes me wonder what Josh knew. What if Josh had been the victim of some form of sexual misconduct at some point? That definitely would have raised the stakes. It definitely would have been ballsy of the monks to orchestrate this disappearance so soon after the publicized monks abuse scandal. But at the same time, if the monks are responsible, then they've succeeded. Josh vanished without a trace, there is no evidence leading back to the campus, and the case remains in limbo ever since. Even though theories concerning this campus are some of the more believed theories as to what happened to Josh, there is another theory that rivals the theory of the monks, if not surpasses it. Welcome back to Mystery Disappearance. In the last episode, we took a look at a few theories concerning Josh's campus and a few of the suspicious monks working and living there. Today, we take a look at one of the most mysterious objects in this entire case, Josh's computer. Now, to paint a picture for you guys as to life in 2002, we need to remember that during this time, the internet was a few years old but still fairly new. Not everybody had a computer, and when they did have a computer, it was usually a bulky tower with a monitor and it took up some space. Technically, laptops existed, but weren't very common at this time and were very expensive. Technically, cell phones existed, but again, they were very rudimentary and only rich businessmen seemed to have these. Security cameras existed as well, but weren't as common as today, so you didn't have surveillance cameras at every street corner during this time. It's important to remember that Josh lived at a time when some of the technology was still very young. 
When Josh disappeared, nobody looked at his computer right away. With the belief that he fell into the nearby waters, his computer just wasn't a consideration in his search early on. So it was a few days before Stearns County took Josh's computer to copy the hard drive, and it's a shame because strange things went on on this computer following Josh's disappearance. One of the things that was determined was that activity took place on his computer the night of his disappearance. From 11.52pm to 12.32am, music was played and several songs were skipped during that time, so somebody was accessing Josh's computer. But who? Remember I said Josh left the card party at approximately 11.55pm? But it is possible that this time is a little off. Maybe Josh left at say 11.47pm and maybe he did make it back to his dorm. Although there is no badging data, but it's possible the door wasn't properly closed or that he caught the door behind another student as it was closing. To this day, nobody has ever come forward saying they let Josh in or saw him in the dorm past midnight. From what I gathered, the music listened to was pretty consistent with music that Josh usually listened to. So could it have been Josh? It is also possible that the computer was accessed by one of his roommates. Let's remember that Josh had five roommates. This was at a time when not everybody had a computer. So I don't know how many of Josh's roommates had their own computers. Was Josh the only one? Were there a couple of other computers? Josh seemed to be pretty open, letting roommates use his computer when they needed. I don't know to what extent Josh let his roommates use his computer. Did he let them use it uh, when he wasn't at the dorm? I, I don't know. Now, we know that Nick was gone at this time to the girls' dorms. Greg got back around 3 a.m., though he doesn't live on the same floor. Another roommate was out of town, and two roommates' location for that night are unaccounted for, so we don't know if they were at the dorm or somewhere else. So, it's still a mystery as to who was on Josh's computer from 11.52 p.m. to 12.32 a.m. Was it Josh? Was it one of his roommates? Apparently, stuff was deleted from Josh's computer that very night. Even more suspicious, an internet washer was used about 3 or 4 days after Josh's disappearance. A washer was a program back then that you downloaded and it erased information like your internet history, cookies, etc. Today we can do these things easily from our internet browser. But who put in the effort of downloading and using this internet washer on Josh's computer? And for what purpose? Over the years, a number of people have taken a look at Josh's hard drive. They had to use different forensic recovery software or tools to try to find the information that was deleted. Some of the more up-to-date information comes from a gentleman by the name of Justin Fole, who has done a lot of meticulous work regarding Josh's hard drive. Once you start backtracking Josh's activities on his computer, there are definitely activities that provide further insight into Josh, and behaviors that now open new theories over his disappearance. Now, the information I'm about to share here comes from either Justin Thole, Stearns County Sheriff Department, or both. As I mentioned last episode, searches were made, most likely by Josh, over the monks abuse scandal. Several different types of searches were done over the month of October, such as monks abuse scandal, strange men following men on campus, and oddities in the woods. Definitely strange that these types of searches were made prior to his disappearance. During the month of October, Josh also visited pornographic sites. Now, a 20-year-old college student visiting pornographic sites, that's the least surprising thing in the world to me. But what can be an area of interest was the type of pornography and the increase in frequency that these sites were visited. On the Simply Vanish podcast, Justin Thole explained that prior to October 2002, Josh's internet activities were pretty mundane and ordinary visiting sports sites, movie sites, etc. Not many pornographic sites visited to speak of. Although he was still with his girlfriend Katie until the summer, but after the summer he was single, so the increase in pornography consumption doesn't surprise me too much. However, what was surprising was the type of pornography. It ranged from heterosexual to homosexual pornography. Josh had been seeing both men and women. Again, none of this really surprises me. Justin Thole also stated that throughout the month of October, the frequency of the visits of these sites increased and the pornography got more explicit. So I think it's fair to say that Josh was maybe developing a bit of an online addiction at this point. I often wondered if maybe it was one of Josh's roommates that had actually been watching this pornography. Remember, some of Josh's roommates did use his computer. However, Justin Thole stated that a lot of these activities were done late at night or early in the mornings. 
Justin also obtained Josh's badge and data into his dorm, all the times that Josh used his keycard to enter the dorms. And the times that he entered the dorm were mostly consistent with his computer activities. For example, badging into his dorm at a certain time and he accessed his computer minutes later. So, for all intended purposes, we are left to assume that Josh did in fact visit these pornographic sites. Another area of interest was Josh had downloaded a Yahoo chat program, I believe in mid-2002. I remember these types of chat rooms. You usually had several types of rooms to choose from, whether it was sports, law, or more romantic or sexual oriented chats. At first Josh was using his own name and zip code to chat with people, but he eventually created two other profiles, presenting himself as a female. You could argue that maybe Josh was trolling, but it would seem that Josh used these profiles to chat sexually with men, or couples. So, was Josh gay or bisexual? Obviously we don't know for sure, although on the Simply Vanish podcast, Josh Newville did interview a man who claims Josh attempted to kiss him in their youths. So we have to assume that there was, at a minimum, a little bit of curiosity there. Friends and family seem quick to shut down any implication that Josh was gay or questioning his sexuality. But speaking from experience, you can really fly under everybody's radar if you really want to. If you're wondering why any of this matters, it matters because it opens up new venues of investigation. Now, you may be wondering what my credibility is in all this. Well, nothing really. No, I'm not an investigator nor law enforcement. I'm just a thinking citizen who does a bit of research and a bit of a philosopher in my own way. I am also a gay man. I'm approximately the age that Josh would be now, so I was around his age in early 2000. So I remember those days, early 2000s university, computer activity, being in the closet, scared, and using chat lines as an outlet, and going for the occasional night encounter. Josh's family and friends might say this is out of character for him, but if you're in the closet and scared, you might do things that are out of character and not safe, speaking from experience. And I will say, the state in which Josh's dorm room was left in is consistent with a hookup. A lot of people thought it was strange that Josh had left everything in his room. Wallet, car keys, glasses, contacts case with his contacts still in them. Seems weird that he would disappear with none of these things on him, right? He literally disappeared with nothing but a St. John's grey hoodie, which wasn't warm enough for that cold November night, and his key to his dorm, and that's it, he had nothing else of note on him. So let's assume that Josh did plan a sexual hookup that night. Why did he wear just a hoodie and not a warmer coat? Well, it could be a college student just being a little careless, but it could also be that he didn't want to sweat under a warm coat if he was going for a hookup. Why didn't he bring his wallet? Well, he could have been a little nervous or scared that he would get mugged or something, so he thought it would be best for him to leave his wallet behind. Why not wear his glasses or his contact lenses? Well, obviously he would want to look his best, so he probably wouldn't wear his glasses. He could have worn his contact lenses, but he could have been worried that one would fall out or something, So, or maybe he just didn't need them. As I mentioned before concerning Josh's wallet, I don't know if he had it on him at the card party. If he did, it would mean that he did make it back to his dorm that night. If Josh was planning a hookup, it could explain why he left the card party somewhat discreetly. Did he make it back to his dorm and listen to music and had some encounter lined up? Obviously we don't know for sure. The only thing that bucks this theory is that there is no evidence that Josh chatted online with somebody to arrange a meeting or hookup that night. So Josh was using Yahoo chat to chat in different rooms, and the sexual nature of these chats progressed during the month of October. Josh chatted with men, women, and seemingly straight couples later in the month. Josh had a webcam as well, and there is evidence that he had viewed other people on their webcams. Here's where things get even more bizarre. On October 28th, a little more than a week before Josh's disappearance, something significant seemed to have happened. There is evidence that Josh visited Yahoo administration. Apparently he wanted to report a user for misconduct. We don't know who or what the misconduct was. Josh actually used a calling card to call an unknown number. As far as we know, he didn't call his family or friends. You usually buy a number of minutes on calling cards, so normally people use them for more important calls, like family or friends. But Josh used his calling card to talk for 28 minutes to an unknown number. So who was he talking to? Was there a connection with Yahoo to report a user for misconduct? That same day, Josh uninstalled and deleted the entire Yahoo chat program. And as far as we know, he didn't download it again or use it after October 28th. 
So what went on here? Is this strange event connected to his disappearance? When I let my little brain wander, here are my five theories as to what could have happened that day. Now keep in mind that there is no evidence of anything here, so this is just my own personal brainstorming. 1. Josh gets into an altercation with a fellow student. Since Josh was sometimes chatting under his own name, or under two names of female profiles, did Josh somehow get discovered by one of his fellow students on campus? Could this student have somehow blackmailed Josh, threatening to expose him or something? Expose him for being gay or as pretending to be a female to catfish photos from men. Josh could have tried to get him banned from Yahoo Chat on the basis of being threatened. Josh panics, gets him banned from Yahoo, then uninstalls the program himself. This scenario doesn't quite explain how Josh would disappear though. This blackmailing student would have most likely needed some resources from outside the campus to make Josh disappear. Unless this was a very homophobic straight man, this would be taking things pretty far. But crazier things have happened. 2. Josh crosses paths online with a monk. It is possible that Josh somehow came across a profile or even a webcam used by one of the monks on campus. We know that some of these monks had histories with college students. So did Josh have him banned from Yahoo Chat? This monk panics over possibly being exposed and orchestrates a plan to make Josh vanish as soon as possible? 3. Josh crosses path with unsavory characters. As I mentioned, Josh seemed to have been consuming increasingly explicit material over the month of October. We don't know exactly what these were, but did Josh chat online with some unsavory characters with bizarre or illegal sexual appetites? Was Josh spooked to the point that he felt he had to get this person off Yahoo chat? But then why would Josh himself delete the program? 4. Josh is hacked. Did Josh somehow come across a hacker, somebody who had a little too much information on him? Josh panics, attempts to get them kicked off, then deletes the program? 5. Completely unrelated. It is possible that this event is completely unrelated to Josh's disappearance, and Josh had an individual ban from Yahoo for other reasons. But then it must have been significant for Josh to also delete the program. The 28 minute use of a calling card is also concerning. But again, we don't know if it's connected. One of the big mysteries is who could have deleted stuff on Josh's computer. Stuff was supposedly deleted the same night of his disappearance and a washer was used a few days later to delete even more stuff. It's a mystery that has been mentioned on the Unsolved Mysteries episode and on various podcasts. It is also worth mentioning that for a few days following Josh's disappearance, his dad Brian Gimo and Uncle Paul did stay at Josh's dorm room as the searches for Josh were going on. One theory was that maybe they downloaded the internet washer to get rid of embarrassing or incriminating evidence. However, on the Simply Vanish podcast, Paul Gimo admitted that they wouldn't have known how to do that back then. They weren't aware that something like that happened, and I don't buy that they would have deleted information on Josh's computer and risked deleting evidence. The washer was downloaded sometime in between Brian and Paul using Josh's computer for doing various searches. So it would seem that somebody carefully planned to do this when Brian and Paul stepped out of the dorm. There must have been evidence of something they wanted to get rid of. If we go back to the theory of the monks, some monks did live in the dorm houses. So some monks would, to a certain extent, have access to the students' dorms. So could it have been a monk that deleted stuff on Josh's computer? If there was a possible altercation between Josh and the monk, whether in person or online, could this be a, why a monk would try to get rid of any evidence? There is another tidbit of information that I came across. Back in episode 3, I mentioned that a document was sent to a state attorney general Mike Hatch from Brian Gimo and attorney Jim Rothstein. I had mentioned that Katie Benson, Alex Jude and a couple of other friends came to confront Brian in a restaurant. I had mentioned that paragraph 2 had a passage stating, During this confrontation, they became very subdued when they were informed that we had cracked Josh's computer and found the phony driver's license operation. Jude stated, we erased all that information. When questioned about the narcotics business they had going on, they had nothing to say. It is apparent that they knew what I was talking about. The line Jude stated, we erased all that information perplexes me. What does this mean exactly? Now, Alex Jude didn't have access to the dorms, but he was friends with Josh's ex-roommates. So could one of the roommates have gone to delete information on the computer? Was there information or chats over fake IDs or a narcotics operation that they wanted to delete and might have inadvertently deleted other crucial evidence in the process? 
To this day, all of Josh's roommates were up and down that they never touched the computer after his disappearance. Now, I'm not trying to point fingers at anybody here, but if one of their friends did erase stuff from Josh's computer, they could possibly be scared of coming forward today for tampering with evidence or something. Now, when it comes to Josh's computer, I've heard different things about how much deleted information was recovered. On some accounts, I've heard that everything was recovered, except maybe some encrypted data. The Mike Hatch document actually says this pretty much in paragraph 2 section C. I've heard other accounts that only about one third of all the computer's data had been recovered. This would make more sense since Justin Thole seems to still be discovering information. Most people believe that the purpose of deleting information after Josh's disappearance was to remove the fake IDs and preventing Josh and other people involved from getting into trouble. But on the Simply Vanish podcast, Justin Thole affirmed that these fake IDs were Adobe files that were never deleted. There are only four or five of them. But if they were never deleted, then that is very mysterious as well. If they didn't want to delete the fake ideas, what else did they want to delete? The links to visited pornographic sites? But nobody knew about this behavior from Josh at this time. The Unsolved Mysteries episode also provided pics of men who were recovered on Josh's computer, probably from his various chats and profiles on Yahoo. The Guimond family was surprised by this. Brian Guimond believes Stearns County Sheriff had these pictures in 2003, but didn't want to release them to the public until 2022, 20 years after Josh's disappearance. Now, I think I might know why these pictures were not released any earlier. This was probably a calculated decision by the Stearns County Sheriff Department. Most of these men, if not all, have nothing to do with Josh's disappearance. So we don't know what their life and family situations were. Releasing these photos could have exposed them as not only being gay, but possibly being kidnappers or even killers. I think it could have hurt a lot of innocent people. It's possible that the people who have caused harm to Josh aren't even here or might not even be using their real photo. So should they have released these pictures any sooner? I'm kinda torn on the question. On one hand, an innocent human being has disappeared here and everyone wants to find out what happened to him. On the other hand, you could have been putting a lot of innocent people in harm's way. I don't know if these men were local either. I mean, did they all live in Minnesota at the time? Were they all over the United States or all over the world? If they're not local, then it's probably a very long shot. So what happened on Josh's computer the week following his disappearance? Did friends and roommates simply want to delete some basic chats referring to drug use or fake ID use? Or was it more sinister and a monk went to delete information because his interactions with Josh would be on this computer? Or were they looking to delete a possible paper that Josh wanted to write about the monk's abuse scandal? Did Josh's online sexual exploration during the month of October land him in very hot water? Or was November 9th simply a sexual encounter gone wrong and the end result was Josh forever vanishing? Or was Josh catfished by a group of homophobes? The possibilities seem endless, and until more evidence is uncovered from Josh's hard drive, we are just left to wonder. Welcome back to Mystery Disappearance. We've taken a look at many theories concerning the disappearance of Joshua Gimon. So far we've assumed that he either died accidentally or was abducted and possibly murdered. I think most people today would believe that Josh is no longer with us. It's been a long time and with almost no sightings of Josh and no attempts to contact his family, especially in today's landscape of social media, we're kind of left to assume the worst. However, Josh's dad Brian Gimo has never given up hope nor his search for his son. Obviously, if you're a close relative or friend of a loved one who vanished like this, you're gonna believe that they're alive until proven otherwise. It's just your duty as a close loved one. Brian Gimo maintains that there's no evidence of a murder and no body was ever found, so you can't really argue with him in that logic. Dead or alive, there is no evidence either way. So could Josh still be alive today? And if so, what's happened to him? Where could he be? Today we're going to take a look at the possibility that Josh is still with us. Early on after his disappearance, many theories surfaced. Did he drown? Did he commit suicide? One of the theories thrown around was that Josh might have willingly disappeared. Could this brilliant, smart university student just decide to walk away from it all one day? 
While it's not completely unfathomable that somebody would do that, there are people who have disappeared in this fashion. Oftentimes they were found days, weeks, months, or even years later. As we mentioned before, everything was left in Josh's room. Wallet, credit cards, car keys, glasses, and contact lenses. And completely disappearing without a trace is very difficult to pull off, even back in 2002. You'd need to get new birth certificates, social security numbers, new photo IDs, new driver's license, etc, etc. You would almost need outside help, and of course there do exist sketchy organizations that might provide documentation for people searching for whole new identities. This scenario doesn't seem to fit Josh though. Again, analysis of Josh's hard drive has never shown any types of searches done for this purpose. No bizarre searches on how to disappear or how to get new identity, producing documents or organizations helping with such purposes. In other words, if Josh decided to disappear, he must have decided spur of the moment because there is no evidence or facts to support that that's what happened. And let's say that Josh did disappear willingly, what would be his motivation for doing so? Did he put himself too high on the pedestal with his law aspirations? He felt like he was crumbling under the pressure and decided to walk away from it all? Did his ex-girlfriend Katie's flourishing relationship with best friend Nick hurt Josh's ego enough to cause him to leave? Or was Josh questioning his sexuality and this fact was too hard to come to terms with and he preferred to leave rather than face his family and friends with this fact? I've mentioned before that Josh had broken up with his girlfriend Katie during the summer of 2002. One thing that was strange is he never told his mom or dad about the breakup. He told his grandparents Gene and Marge, he told his friends, he told his mock coach trial Miss Olga Zentino, but he never told his parents which, which is strange, like why wouldn't he? From what we can gather of Josh's personality, he had a lot of pride and was always happy to show off his accolades and trophies to his parents, so obviously he wanted to make his parents proud, which is true for all of us. But to me this indicates that Josh didn't like to provide bad news as much. Maybe he didn't have a clear answer for the breakup, or if he was questioning his sexuality, maybe he was afraid that his parents get too close to this fact. These are the only reasons I can think of, but for some reason Josh hid the breakup from his parents. Of course all of this is speculation and this knee jerk reaction seems way too harsh for Josh. He was a young man of integrity and pride and to just walk away from it all without telling anybody would really be uncharacteristic of him. If he was gay or bisexual, I imagine he would just have kept it a secret for as long as he could. No need to overreact and vanish forever. Josh disappearing willingly seemed to be a theory suggested either by officers or people who didn't know Josh well. Those who did know Josh don't buy that he would even anticipate disappearing for any reason. So if Josh didn't disappear willingly, was he perhaps abducted? Was he forcefully taken against his will? And if so, by whom and why? I remember the first time I was pondering the possibility of Josh still being alive. The first thing that popped into my mind was that Josh might have been absorbed into some form of sex trafficking ring. At first it sounds far fetched and I initially rejected the idea, but as I was looking up information online, I came across a statement by Brian Gimo saying, there's all kinds of human trafficking going on, sex slaves, all that crap. Nobody wants to talk about, that's real, it's happening. So how implausible is it really? Here's what we know. Josh seemed to have been exploring online with various types of pornography. Some men, some women, and some explicit material. He has seen a few people on cam, he chatted with girls, with guys, with couples. And on the infamous date of October 28th, he reported a user on Yahoo chat, uninstalled the program and had a 28 minute conversation on the telephone using a calling card to an unknown source. So could there be a connection? Josh disappeared a week and a half after this. I mentioned before that there are almost no sightings of Josh after his disappearance. There is just one known possible sighting though. Brian has a couple of friends named Mike and Sue. On March 28 of 2003, over four months after his disappearance, Sue claimed that she and Mike were on vacation in Las Vegas, Nevada. And she was startled when she came across a young man who looked very much like Joshua. He was dressed in a dark St. John's sweatshirt and she mentioned that his hair was a bit spiked, his hair flush red, looking tired. She turned to her husband Mike to bring his attention to the young man but when they both turned around to look, the young man was gone. Sue was shaken by this and wrote it in her diary. 
They told Brian sometime later, obviously they couldn't be 100% sure, but when you think about it, it starts to further add meat to the bone. Let's say Josh was abducted and forced into some sex trafficking ring, what course of events would happen? Obviously, he would at minimum be moved to another state. I assumed that, for a long time, not many people outside of Minnesota were familiar with Josh's story. This is probably true for many abductions, it depends on the media coverage. And what do we know about Las Vegas, Nevada? A beautiful city, lots of lights, casinos, gambling, cool buildings, and it's known to have a lot of sex work, and even human trafficking, with people literally being sold. It's a very dark topic that nobody wants to dive into, but Brian Gimo never turned a blind eye to such a possibility. One detail I find strange is that whether Josh disappeared willingly or not, in either case wouldn't he ditch the St. John's hoodie? That would be a giant clue to anybody who sees him with that, but who knows. You may have seen news reportings or documentaries or whatever on the subject of sex trafficking and human trafficking. They seem to have an established modus operandi. They kidnap kids or abduct young men and women, and then they start systematic methods of abuse and control. They reveal that they know all their information, the addresses of their families, etc. And if they ever step out of line, they can threaten to kill them and their entire family. With weeks and months of methodic psychological abuse, they can break down their victims to the point that they will never attempt to escape. Josh seemed like a strong-willed young man who couldn't be easily corrupted by something like this, but sadly it can happen to anybody. Brian Gimon and his parents never gave up hope on finding Joshua. To this day, they keep doing their own investigation, as much as limited funds will allow. Brian does have a GoFundMe page set up, though getting the word out for funding hasn't been easy. As for Brian's investigation, we don't know for sure what his methods are, or what information he has come across. He has mentioned on the Simply Vanish podcast that there are areas of interest as possible current locations of Josh. He has mentioned Washington State, Idaho, and Montana. He also mentions that these areas of interest change. Brian is seemingly working with two people to investigate the whereabouts of Josh. As I said, we don't know many specifics on the investigation methods. Brian has talked about remote directional locating, stating that quantum physics and electromagnetism are involved. I've heard Patrick Marker on the Unfound Postcat stating that possible research methods might include psychics, ESP, extrasensory perception, or even dowsing rods and magnets. So, a lot of these methods would suggest the use of science, pseudoscience, and even the sixth sense. We don't know for sure which of these methods Brian has used, if any. Now, I'll admit, I'm not very familiar with these terms and how you can put them into practice, so I can't comment on these. I can only hope that these methods are legit and that the family isn't being taken advantage of in some way. This family has suffered enough. If Josh is still with us today, I would assume that his appearance might have drastically changed. Maybe tattoos to the face or something? It is difficult to substantiate. I would also assume that Josh would be out of the country. But I haven't done the investigations that Mr. Brian Gimo and his family have done, so I wouldn't be the one to know, obviously. Let's say Josh was abducted in some sex trafficking ring. The role he plays could possibly be different now, too, being in his 40s. So, is Joshua Gimon still alive today? I am left to wonder if he is or not. Remember, there is no evidence either way. And if Josh is no longer with us, I do wonder when he left us. Was he killed the very night that he disappeared? Or was he alive for a time after? Was he spotted in Las Vegas in March of 2003 by Brian's friends? As far as we know, there have been no other sightings of Josh, although Stearns County Sheriff Department received a surge in tips following the airing of the Unsolved Mysteries episode, but we don't know what those tips are, if any are sightings, and obviously the case is still unsolved. It's a story that we hope comes to light someday. Hello everybody, and welcome back to Mystery Disappearance. Today we conclude our theories over the disappearance of Joshua Gimon. If you've watched my other videos, you've seen that the theories really go in many different directions. Everything surrounding this case looks suspicious. Any investigations, whether by law enforcement or civilians who take an interest in this case, end up going in circles. I've released these videos because I myself took an interest in this case, even though I'm in no position to do any real investigation, I don't live in Minnesota, but the real purpose of these videos was to keep the story of Josh Gimo alive. This young man disappeared without a trace, and doesn't deserve to be forgotten, even better if we can learn the truth one day. 
But before we head into the conclusion of this miniseries, we're going to take a look at some final theories, tie up some loose ends before we finish this thing. Now, I'm not gonna go into great detail in these. These theories are either not as believed anymore, or they just open the door to even more speculation than what I've already done. So, without further delay, let's get into it. On the Simply Vanish podcast, Mr. Josh Newville interviewed a few individuals with somewhat similar stories. They were approached by some large vehicle, such as a four-door pickup truck or SUV, usually late at night, with at least three or four men in the vehicle. Some were approached with an apparent emergency, asking the lone pedestrian for help, inviting them inside their vehicle and then driving to a secluded location. Then some form of attempted sexual assault occurred, or sometimes murder, like in the Chris Jenkins case. One of these strange occurrences happened two weeks after Josh's disappearance. Because of the disappearance, many students were afraid to go out for the next few weeks. But one individual did go out a couple of weeks after, and found himself walking alone at night with a few beers inside him. And he was approached by one of these strange vehicles. Another guy admitted to being approached in a similar manner. They started asking him questions, but he got spooked and started running away as they chased him. He was able to get away. A couple of individuals have stated that the suspicious men were in their 20s. Another individual has had a similar incident and stated that the men were burly men in their 40s. So what's going on here? Is this some form of early 2000s trend of men banding together to lure men inside their vehicles or flat out abduct them to commit these late night sexual assaults and or murders? Obviously, the internet gave a way for like-minded individuals to chat up and meet, so it makes you wonder if Josh was a victim of such a group. Could Josh have been approached that night on his way back to his dorm? Miss Olga Zentino has stated that Josh was a very confident young man, and if a car slowed down by him on the road and people claiming they need some form of help, she believes that Josh would have confidently gone into the vehicle, not being afraid of anything or sensing any danger. Some men don't seem to think they can ever be victim of anything, which is why sometimes some of them walk home from the bar, alone and intoxicated. Did this general mindset make it easy for some malintentioned individuals to prey on young men coming out of bars? Obviously, if Josh was approached by a vehicle of randoms, this is difficult to investigate since they probably just passed by Josh briefly, could have convinced him to enter the vehicle, then they vanish into the night with no evidence whatsoever. It's very possible and a very creepy thought. Possibly tying a little bit into the last theory I just mentioned, it was speculated early on over the possibility of a serial type killer who was targeting college age males around this time. There seemed to be a lot of deaths of young men in bodies of water around this period, over 40 in 3 or 4 different states, and this from the late 1990s to early to mid 2000s. The theory goes like this. A group of individuals abduct drunk young men who come out of bars or parties, then ultimately dump their victims' bodies in the water, possibly alive at the time. Many of these deaths were ruled a suicide or accidental death, especially if no bruises or no evidence of a struggle are found. Then, there always seems to be some smiley face nearby, a graffiti painted on concrete or something. This combination of mysterious deaths gave birth to a smiley face killer theory. It was wondered if Josh could have been the victim of such a killer or group of killers. It was wondered about Chris Jenkins as well. Although I don't believe that any smiley faces were anywhere near Chris Jenkins' body, and Josh's body was never found. Whether such a group of killers exists or not raises debate to this day. Some people still believe in the theory, while others dismiss it as pure nonsense. Today we all know about emoticons and use it in our everyday chats and texting, but even back in 2002, the smiley face had already taken the world by storm, made up of basic punctuation that people usually put at the end of their sentences. So finding these basic smileys everywhere as graffiti was nothing unusual. It is the simplest graffiti to make after all, very simple and quickly done in no time, and they were found everywhere. Now, if you sadly find deceased bodies in rivers and lakes, what do you usually find close to rivers and lakes? Normally bridges or overpasses, right? And bridges usually have concrete foundation with pillars and a lot of space for people to draw graffiti. There always seem to be drawings and smiley faces and all sorts of graffiti on those. So it is hard to link one of those smiley faces to a dead body nearby, though it's not completely impossible. 
Another thing was, if there were smiley face killers, you'd think the smiley face would have some sort of signature, a certain consistent look. But the smileys found were all sorts of shapes, sizes, colors, they didn't really have a consistent look from one another. Yet, if you look online, you can find individuals, on podcasts or whatever, who claim to have been abducted by people claiming to be part of the smiley face killers, and they somehow escaped. So, you gotta wonder if they really were victims of the smiley face killers, or people who just say they're part of the smiley face killer. Did people create the legend, or did the legend create people? Did such a group actually exist? If Josh was the victim of a so-called smiley face killer, then why hasn't his body been found? This wouldn't fit their pattern. But what if Josh resisted or fought back, and they felt that their only option was to shoot him? In that case, they couldn't dump the body in a lake, because a gun wound would reveal too much information. All of this is speculation on my behalf. Many working in law enforcement seem to doubt or dismiss the theory of the smiley face killer. There was no concrete evidence to link the 40 plus deaths, although the death of so many youths in bodies of water was strange. But it would seem that the smiley face killer is nothing more than an urban legend at this point. On the episode of Unsolved Mysteries, Stearns County Sheriff's Department revealed that an orange Pontiac Sunfire had been intercepted twice by the St. John University Life and Safety in and around the time Josh disappeared. This vehicle seemed to be driving around the campus a few times. On one occasion, Life and Safety stopped the vehicle, and a young college-aged male ran out of the car and disappeared before Life and Safety could intercept them. On another account, Life and Safety stopped the vehicle and questioned the driver as he had a college-age student in the passenger seat. He stated that he was dropping him on campus. My first impression was this was just a local gay man cruising around at night for hookups. Okay, maybe that's a little creepy on its own, but it doesn't necessarily mean he's an abductor or killer. This surprisingly happens a lot, gay men living in the shadows. The student who ran away might possibly have been a closeted young gay man who was afraid of getting caught or exposed in this affair. He didn't want to be found out by life and safety or the police, so he possibly panicked and ran out of the car and ran home. Instead of a hookup, it is possible that the car was some drug vendor circulating drugs to and from the campus. What made this theory more bizarre was the fact that by the time Stearns County investigated this area of interest more closely, the car had been crushed. Obviously, authorities must know who the owner of the car is. I assume he's been questioned, and officers found nothing of note. Now, my question is, how long after Josh's disappearance was this car crushed? If it was crushed within weeks or months of Josh disappearing, then I definitely would say this is bizarre. Now, if authorities investigated this 10 years after the fact, and the car was crushed years after Josh's disappearance, then I'm a little less surprised. I don't know what this car has been through. Was it in an accident? Was it totaled? Is that why it was crushed? It's not completely impossible that this driver might have come across Josh at some point, either the night of his disappearance or before. The identity of the driver hasn't been revealed, though it's been confirmed that he isn't connected to any of the pictures of the various men found on Josh's computer. So this is another theory that isn't any more or less suspicious than any of the other ones. One of the earlier theories was if Josh had been victim of some sort of satanic cult. South of St. John's University, across the Sega Tegan Lake, there is a chapel called the Stella Maris Chapel. Apparently the chapel had been defaced with various satanic symbols. I didn't find an exact time frame of when these symbols could have been drawn, but the Gimon family wondered if there could have been some connection to Josh. However, both Stearns County Sheriff's Department and St. John's University have stated that this chapel and other ones had been defaced and graffitied before, whether satanic symbols were drawn or swastikas or racial slurs. It's a religious college campus, so I can buy that they are victim of hate crimes or graffitis from time to time. There isn't a lot of information on this theory, but authorities didn't take this information seriously, believing that it is difficult to establish a connection between a defaced chapel and the disappearance of a student. I haven't found information on if there was some form of satanic cult in or around campus. Sometimes students form weird cults, whether it's one of those vampire cults or something else. There's no evidence that Josh was ever in contact with such a cult, whether in person or online. Unless you want to associate this theory with the strange events on October 28th, where Josh called an unknown number, had an individual banned from Yahoo Chat, then deleted his account, could Josh have accidentally come in contact with some obscure cult? But regardless, the satanic cult theory hasn't been explored much. 
I think I've touched on most of the theories concerning Josh's disappearance. As time goes on, it seems as though more theories come out and endless speculation. But now it's your turn to voice your opinions. Obviously none of us knows for sure what happened to Josh, but based on all the information that's out there, what do you think happened to Joshua Gimo? Did Josh jump or fell in one of the nearby lakes of the campus, and for whatever reason his body has never surfaced and wasn't found by competent drivers or the best technological devices? Did Josh accidentally die at the card party from an overdose or whatever, and the other students decided to cover it up? Or some type of premeditated plan was made by the group to get rid of Josh for some unknown reason? Are ex-girlfriend Katie Benson and or best friend Nick Hajikovic responsible for getting rid of Josh, either because of a blossoming romance or for some other unknown reason? Could one or a few of the monks on campus be responsible for the disappearance, either because of some accident that they decided to cover up or to silence this student who was voicing his concern and wanted to write a paper on the monks' abuse scandal? Could Josh himself have been victim of some form of sexual advance and threatened his abuser? Did Josh's online exploration land him in an unsafe situation, by crossing some undesirable online who somehow got enough information to find Josh and cause harm to him? Or was it a mere hookup gone wrong? Could Josh have disappeared by his own decision, or could he have been abducted by a group of people and forced into some illegal underground operation? Could Josh still be alive today, or was at least alive for some time after his disappearance? Could a group of rough rousing or sexual deviant men have forced Josh into their vehicle, or somehow convinced him to enter the vehicle and something happened? Is there a killer or killers who named themselves the smiley face killer who abducted Josh, but never dumped his body in the water which wouldn't fit their normal pattern? Was a driver of an orange Pontiac Sunfire whose strange late night cruisings caught the attention of campus security a couple of times? Or was there some bizarre cult near the university who, randomly or not, chose Josh as their victim? Let me know in the comments what you believe might have happened. Do you think one of my theories is right, or do you have another theory that I haven't covered? If there are details that I've missed, feel free to comment to any of these videos. I'm still finding tidbits even now as I'm wrapping up these videos. And if you were around Joshua Gimon around that time and have information that you never shared, please talk. Even if you have to send some anonymous letter to somebody. My heart goes out to Josh's friends, but my heart especially goes out to Brian Gimo and Lisa Cheney, Josh's parents, and to the rest of his family. This is a tragedy and whoever is responsible shouldn't get away with this. What about myself? What theory do I believe the most? Well, that's a difficult question for me to answer. My brain goes to different theories at different times. When I think about the monks at the school, I think their behavior is a very likely possibility. When I think about Josh's online behavior, I think there are a lot of possibilities there as well. Even the students at the card party, even though some of the theories get more complex, it could be something as simple as Josh overdosing on some sort of drug, then the attendees at the party decided to cover it up and efficiently got rid of the body. Although that is a bit of a quick overdose, but depending on what drug and what quantity of it, you also wonder if one theory bleeds into another. For example, was Nick contacted by someone from the party that night, and Nick made his way to the party to decide what to do about the situation with Josh? Was that why his timing differed from Katie's recollection? I think it's pretty gruesome if the kids at the party and Nick did that, got rid of the body then kept silent about it. You'd think at least one of them would crack from the guilt. There's no way Nick could have fallen asleep that night either, and he had engagements the next day, but we just don't know for sure. Today, Josh would most likely be a successful lawyer with his own firm, or maybe a senator, or maybe even president. Gosh, what could have been. I hope someday I can make one final video on Joshua Gimon, the video where we finally have the answers. Until then everybody, keep your eyes open and keep Josh's stories alive.